So this woman on the Upper East Side of Manhattan is at an art gallery, and she is stunned by this beautiful painting. She can't take her eyes off of it. In fact, she comes back to the gallery several times over, and she just is fixated on this picture. She's also fixated on the price tag right next to it that says $150,000. But she just cannot stop looking at it, and she has to have it. So she sends a telegram to her husband, who's half the way around the world on business, uh, asking uh, what he thinks of buying this painting for $150,000. And he gets it, and he hastily sends back a telegram that says, no, price too high. And she receives this telegram, and her heart is lifted, and she is elated as she reads that her loving husband says, no, price too high. <laughs> A comma can make a big difference. <laughs> Our faith has hinged on one letter, an iota, the Greek letter for I. There is a word that was fought over tooth and nail uh, at a council some 1,700 years ago, the Council of Nicaea. And the difference between homoousius and homoousius was the difference between the church we have today and a church uh, that would have been vastly different. One meant that Jesus was of the very same substance as God. When you read the creed, you'll see three different times we affirm that truth that Jesus is God. That little I would mean Jesus is of a like substance. And it was very Episcopal, a good compromise that keeps people on this side satisfied. Uh, there's enough room there that you could believe he was the same substance, and there's enough room over here that if you weren't quite sure, you could still uh, uh, hold fast. But there was a gentleman who wouldn't stand for that. He thought this was one of those moments where we need to be clear. Is Jesus God, the same God that we know through all creation, or is Jesus just a wonderful human being that somehow reflected as, as, as beautifully as anyone ever in the story of history, the Spirit of God? Is he God or is he? And Athanasius, who's already uh, known for being the kind of guy that makes meetings last twice as long as they need to, won't let them adjourn. They're all ready. They finished. They wrapped it all up. They have time to get home for the Redskins game. And he says, hold on. No. We need to be definitive about this. Our faith for the rest of time will hinge on this truth. Is Jesus God? And the Holy Spirit moves and the people determine absolutely. Why is this so important? Jesus is just higher than the prophets. Jesus is just like God. And Jesus isn't the full pouring out of God's presence here on earth. Jesus isn't the full revelation of God. God didn't fully enter into our human experience to walk as we walk, to suffer as we suffer, to know what it is to be fully human. And to reveal to us fully the heart, the message of God. Jesus isn't fully the Son of God, isn't fully God. The pouring his life out on the cross doesn't transform history for the rest of time. It doesn't give us the promise that brings us here Sunday in and Sunday out, the promise that we know at the end of this life, well, will we get the life to come. The Trinity is similar in that our understanding of who God is what allows the church to continue to go outside these doors and preach and affirm that God is in the world, about the world, created the world, redeemed the world, sustains the world. But the Trinity sometimes leaves a scratch in our hand. You can't cuddle the Trinity. You can't throw your arms around the idea of the Trinity. It's the only Sunday of the church here dedicated to a doctrine. And we have a lot of ways of talking about God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. I'm a dad, I'm a husband, I'm a pastor, I have many, one person, many identities. Uh, you know, we use ice, water, and, uh, and, 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 and air uh, is, is the same compound with different reflections. But that doesn't get to the heart of why we need that in the trick. Each one of itself is in the knowledge that God made this beautiful world on a beautiful morning like today where we walk outside and we breathe deeply and we say, God made us and all of this for us is wonderful. But if God is the clock maker who walked away after that, it's incomplete. Even the God that keeps calling us 
into a relationship through the prophets, through, through covenant, is incomplete until we get the story of the God who's so relentlessly seeking us that he sends his son, God, the son, into the world. Pour out that love to redeem us, to bind ourselves to God. If that was the last point of God in history, that still would be incomplete because we need to know that God still works and is amongst us and guides us towards that truth. God, the Holy Spirit, is working in this world, providing hope, providing love, shaping our lives. But that Holy Spirit is dependent. On knowing God the Father and God the Son. And that's how we can trust the Holy Spirit, the God that works in and through our lives. <clears throat> Trinity allows us to see the all encompassing reach of God, the kind of God that called Nicodemus from a, 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 a life of knowing exactly who God was. He was a Pharisee, he was well studied, he had status, but something about the Relentlessness, the extent of God that he sees in Jesus compels him to go in at the late night hours of the night so he doesn't lose his standing to say, what is this that draws me to you? What is this that I see in you that is so much tugging at my heart? Jesus doesn't debate him. He doesn't go to him once. He says, you need to jump in. You need to jump into the God that seeks you out, the God of relationship, God who calls you to a new birth, to a new life, bound in God. There's a word. I don't a lot of read today. Perichoresis. Uh, it, it sounds like something you see a dentist about, but it is not. Perichoresis means rotation. And it's a God, it's a name for the, for the Trinity of a God that continues to move and shape and, and, and live in perfect relationship with one another. It's called the divine dance. The, uh, you always see that the symbols of the Trinity in motion, that God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit live in relationship with one another. That in that dance, in that relationship, we understand that God is not just love, and God's not just love reaching out for us, but that God is in God's self, relationship. And that's what Jesus invites Nicodemus to jump into, to be part of this divine dance, to be born from above, to be in relationship with God, to grow more and more in love with God. Two dance stories that I think help, at least help me. Uh, one is uh, we were in Louisville, and we had a lot of Germans in our, our congregation, and there was a very vibrant German club. Uh, so one of uh, my favorite parishioners decided she was going to invite the whole church to come to a German club night. We were going to have St. Andrew's night at the German club uh, with delicious food and drink. Uh, and the one unexpected part, which I might not have participated in, uh, involved dancing. And if there's one thing that's hard to do is to get me on a dance floor. Uh, but you have to see how this works in this German club. Uh, you have children from about two years old uh, uh, children up to children of God uh, nearing three digits uh, all gathered around in a circle. And the dance is so nonsensical, so unrhythmic that uh, you can't help but be invited in. And if you're sitting in a chair, there's at least five people nudging you to come in. Uh, and if you want to see the bar lower, they start with a chicken dance just to let everybody know uh, that they're invited. Uh, but it looks a lot like that invitation. It's a dance where everybody is welcome, where everybody is reaching out, trying to pull everybody who's still in their chair onto the dance floor so that they can participate in the relationship, in the divine dance. That's what we're called to do. We're called to pull people from the sidelines into that relationship with God, into that relationship with one another. But it takes work. It takes commitment and it takes getting to know a little bit more about God that you want to dance with. I talk to uh, people as they get ready to be, get married in their pre-marriage counseling. Uh, I sometimes feel like 24-year-old men don't have an absolutely enormous understanding of what intimacy might look like throughout the longevity of our lives. And so I tell this story that I came across, I think, in middle school. Uh, it was the person who wrote everything I need to know. I learned in kindergarten. He wrote a sequel. And one of them is just an image uh, that he just sort of finds himself uh, entranced with. Uh, and it's the perfect image of intimacy, of relationship. He describes being at a dance and seeing uh, these two people in their late 90s dancing together. A couple that clearly had 
shared decade upon decade upon decade of their lives together. And he watched when they danced, and it wasn't swirling around the room. Uh, it wasn't even the swiftest action, but it completed each other. Each action was a reaction to knowing the infirmity and the strength of the other, of anticipating the other's move in such perfection, of knowing uh, which, which, which trick ankle or, 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 or hip didn't quite swing the same way and was flying. And he said as he watched, as he watched them look into each other's eyes, and he watched them be able to dance without having to think about it, to just know that person so well that they knew where they would be, and they knew where they needed support that he saw intimacy in a relationship like he'd never seen before. That's what God wants from us. To know God that well. To know that God seeks us and the knowledge of us that fully. That's what God invites us. God invites us into that dance, into that relationship. God invites us to come to that table to participate in God as the body of Christ. To be fed and nourished and welcomed body of Christ, into that divine dance, and to reach out and pull other people in.